A Storm of Swords Chapter 47 Arya When they reached the top of the ridge and saw the river, Sandra Clegane reined up hard and cursed. The rain was falling from a black iron sky, pricking the green and brown torrent with ten thousand swords. It must be a mile across, Arya thought. The tops of half a hundred trees poked out of the swirling waters, their limbs clutching for the sky like the arms of drowning men. Thick mats of sodden leaves choked the shoreline, and farther out in the channel she glimpsed something pale and swollen, a deer or perhaps a dead horse moving swiftly downstream. There was a sound, too, a low rumble at the edge of hearing, like the sound a dog makes just before he growls. Arya squirmed in the saddle and felt the links of the hound's mail digging into her back. His arms encircled her. On the left, the burned arm, he donned a steel vambrace for protection, but she'd seen him change the dressings, and the flesh beneath was still raw and seeping. If the burns pained him, though, Sandra Clegane gave no hint of it. Is this the Blackwater Rush? They had ridden so far in rain and darkness through trackless woods and nameless villages that Arya had lost all sense of where they were. It's a river we need to cross, that's all you need to know. Clegane would answer her from time to time, but he had warned her not to talk back. He had given her a lot of warnings that first day. The next time you hit me, I'll tie your hands behind your back, he'd said. The next time you try and run off, I'll bind your feet together. Scream or shout or bite me again and I'll gag you. We can ride double, or I can throw you across the back of the horse, trussed up like a sow for slaughter. Your choice. She had chosen to ride, but the first time they made camp, she'd waited until she thought he was asleep, and found a big, jagged rock to smash his ugly head in. Quiet as a shadow, she told herself as she crept toward him, but that wasn't quiet enough. The hound hadn't been asleep after all, or maybe he'd woken. Whichever it was, his eyes opened, his mouth twitched, and he took the rock away from her as if she were a baby. The best she could do was kick him. I'll give you that one, he said when he flung the rock into the bushes. But if you're stupid enough to try again, I'll hurt you. Why don't you just kill me like you did Micah? Arya had screamed at him. She was still defiant then, more angry than scared. He answered by grabbing the front of her tunic and yanking her within an inch of his burned face. The next time you say that name, I'll beat you so bad you'll wish I killed you. After that, he rolled her in his horse blanket every night when he went to sleep, and tied ropes around her top and bottom so she was bound up as tight as a babe in swaddling clothes. It has to be the black water, Arya decided as she watched the rain lash the river. The hound was Joffrey's dog. He was taking her back to the Red Keep to hand to Joffrey and the Queen. She wished that the sun would come out so she could tell which way they were going. The more she looked at the moss on the trees, the more confused she got. The black water wasn't so wide at King's Landing— but that was before the rains. The fords will all be gone, Sandra Clegane said, and I wouldn't care to try and swim over either. There's no way across, she thought. Lord Beric will catch us for sure. Clegane had pushed his big black stallion hard, doubling back thrice to throw off pursuit, once even riding half a mile up the center of a swollen stream. But Arya still expected to see the outlaws every time she looked back. She had tried to help them by scratching her name on the trunks of trees when she went in the bushes to make water, but the fourth time she did that he caught her, and that was the end of that. It doesn't matter, Arya told herself. Thoris will find me in his flames. Only he hadn't. Not yet, anyway, and once they crossed the river... Haraway's town shouldn't be far, the hound said. Well, Lord Root stables old King Anderhur's two-headed water horse. Maybe we'll ride across. Arya had never heard of old King Anderhur. She'd never seen a horse with two heads, either, especially not one who could run on water, but she knew better than to ask. She held her tongue and sat stiff as the hound turned the stallion's head and trotted along the ridgeline, following the river downstream. At least the rain was at their backs this way. She'd had enough of it stinging her eyes half-blind and washing down her cheeks like she was crying. Wolves never cry, she reminded herself again. It could not have been much past noon, but the sky was dark as dusk. They had not seen the sun in more days than she could count. Arya was soaked to the bone, saddle sore, sniffling, and achy. She had a fever, too, and sometimes shivered uncontrollably, but when she told the hound that she was sick, he'd only snarled at her. Wipe your nose and shut your mouth, he told her. Half the time he slept in the saddle now, trusting his stallion to follow whatever rutted farm track or game trail they were on. The horse was a heavy courser, almost as big as a destrier, but much faster. Stranger, the hound called him. 
Arya had tried to steal him once when Clegane was taking a piss against a tree, thinking she could ride off before he could catch her. Stranger had almost bitten her face off. He was gentle as an old gelding with his master, but otherwise he had a temper as black as he was. She had never known a horse so quick to bite or kick. They rode beside the river for hours, splashing across two muddy vassal streams before they reached the place that Sandra Clegane had spoken of. Lord Haraway's town, he said, and then, when he saw it, seven hells. The town was drowned and desolate. The rising waters had overflowed the river banks. All that remained of Haraway's town was the upper story of a daub and waddle inn, the seven-sided dome of a sunken sept, two-thirds of a stone round tower, some moldy thatch roofs, and a forest of chimneys. But there was smoke coming from the tower, Arya saw, and below one arched window a wide, flat-bottomed boat was chained up tight. The boat had a dozen oarlocks and a pair of great carved wooden horse heads mounted fore and aft. A two-headed horse, she realized. There was a wooden house with a sod roof right in the middle of the deck, and when the hound cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted, two men came spelling out. A third appeared in the window of the round tower, clutching a loaded crossbow. "'What do you want?' he shouted across the swirling brown waters. "'Take us over!' the hound shouted back. The men in the boat conferred with one another. One of them, a grizzled, gray-haired man with thick arms and a bent back, stepped to the rail. "'It'll cost you. Then I'll pay.' With what? Arya wondered. The outlaws had taken Clegane's gold, but maybe Lord Beric had left him some silver and copper. A ferry ride shouldn't cost more than a few coppers. The ferrymen were talking again. Finally, the bent-backed one turned away and gave a shout. Six more men appeared, pulling up hoods to keep the rain off their heads. Still more squirmed out the holdfast window and leapt down onto the deck. Half of them looked enough like the bent-backed man to be his kin. Some of them undid the chains and took up long poles, while the others slid heavy, wide-bladed oars through the locks. The ferry swung about and began to creep slowly toward the shallows, oars stroking smoothly on either side. Sandra Clegane rode down the hill to meet it. When the aft end of the boat slammed into the hillside, the ferryman opened a wide door beneath the carved horse's head and extended a heavy oaken plank. Stranger balked at the water's edge, but the hound put his heels into the courser's flank and urged him up the gangway. The bent-backed man was waiting for them on deck. "'Wet enough for you, sir?' he asked, smiling. The hound's mouth gave a twitch. "'I need your boat, not your bloody wit!' He dismounted and pulled Arya down beside him. One of the boatmen reached for Stranger's bridle. "'I wouldn't,' Clegane said as the horse kicked. The man leapt back, slipped on the rain-slick deck, and crashed onto his arse, cursing. The ferryman with the bent back wasn't smiling any longer. "'We can get you across,' he said sourly. He will cost you a gold piece, another for the horse, a third for the boy. Three dragons? Clegane gave a bark of laughter. For three dragons I should own the bloody ferry. Last year might be a could, but with this river I'll need extra hands on the poles and oars just to see we don't get swept a hundred miles out to sea. Here's your choice. Three dragons or you teach that hell horse how to walk on water. I like an honest brigand. Have it your way. Three dragons? When you put us ashore safe on the north bank. I'll have them now where we don't go. The man thrust out a thick, calloused hand, palm up. Clegane rattled his longsword to loosen the blade in the scabbard. Here's your choice. Gold on the north bank or steel on the south. The ferryman looked up at the hound's face. Arya could tell he didn't like what he saw there. He had a dozen men behind him, strong men with oars and hardwood poles in their hands, but none of them were rushing forward to help him. Together they could overwhelm Sander Clegane, though he'd likely kill three or four of them before they took him down. "'How do I know you're good for it?' the bent-backed man asked after a moment. "'He's not,' she wanted to shout. Instead, she bit her lip. "'Knight's honor,' the hound said, unsmiling. "'He's not even a knight.' She did not say that, either. "'That'll do,' the ferryman spat. "'Come on, then, we can have you across before dark.' Tie the horse up, I don't want him spooking when we're underway. There's a brazier in the cabin if you and your son want to get warm. I'm not a stupid son, said Arya furiously. That was even worse than being taken for a boy. She was so angry that she might have told them who she really was, only Sandra Clegane grabbed her by the back of the collar and hoisted her one-handed off the deck. How many times do I need to tell you to shut your bloody mouth? He shook her so hard her teeth rattled, then let her fall. Get in there and get dry, like the man said. Arya did as she was told. 
The big iron brazier was glowing red, filling the room with a sullen, suffocating heat. It felt pleasant to stand beside it, to warm her hands and dry off a little bit, but as soon as she felt the deck move under her feet, she slipped back out through the forward door. The two-headed horse eased slowly through the shallows, picking its way between the chimneys and rooftops of drowned Haraway. A dozen men labored at the oars while four more used the long poles to push off whenever they came too close to a rock, a tree, or a sudden house. The bent-backed man had the rudder. Rain pattered against the smooth planks of the deck and splashed off the tall carved horse heads fore and aft. Arya was getting soaked again, but she didn't care. She wanted to see. The man with the crossbow still stood in the window of the round tower she saw. His eyes followed her as the fairy slid by underneath. She wondered if he was this Lord Root that the Hound had mentioned. He doesn't look much like a lord, but then she didn't look much like a lady either. Once they were beyond the town and out in the river proper, the current grew much stronger. Through the grey haze of rain, Arya could make out a tall stone pillar on the far shore that surely marked the ferry landing, but no sooner had she seen it than she realized that they were being pushed away from it downstream. The oarsmen were rowing more vigorously now, fighting the rage of the river. Leaves and broken branches swirled past as fast as if they'd been fired from a scorpion. The men with the poles leaned out and shoved away anything that came too close. It was windier out here, too. Whenever she turned to look upstream, Arya got a face full of blowing rain. Stranger was screaming and kicking as the deck moved underfoot. If I jumped over the side, the river would wash me away before the hound even knew that I was gone. She looked back over a shoulder and saw Sandra Clegane struggling with his frightened horse, trying to calm him. She would never have a better chance to get away from him. They might drown, though. John used to say that she swam like a fish, but even a fish might have trouble in this river. Still, drowning might be better than King's Landing. She thought about Joffrey and crept up to the prow. The river was murky brown with mud and lashed by rain, looking more like soup than water. Arya wondered how cold it would be. I couldn't get much wetter than I am now. She put a hand on the rail. But a sudden shout snapped her head about before she could leap. The ferrymen were rushing forward, poles in hand. For a moment she did not understand what was happening. Then she saw it. An uprooted tree, huge and dark, coming straight at them. A tangle of roots and limbs poked up out of the water as it came, like the reaching arms of a great kraken. The oarsmen were backing water frantically, trying to avoid a collision that could capsize them or stove their hull in. The old man had wrenched the rudder about, and the horse at the prow was swinging downstream, but too slowly. Glistening brown and black, the tree rushed toward them like a battering ram. It could not have been more than ten feet from their prow when two of the boatmen somehow caught it with their long poles. One snapped, and the long, splintering crack made it sound as if the ferry were breaking up beneath them. But the second man managed to give the trunk a hard shove, just enough to deflect it away from them. The tree swept past the ferry with inches to spare, its branches scrabbling like claws against the horse head. Only just when it seemed as if they were clear, one of the monster's upper limbs dealt them a glancing thump. The ferry seemed to shudder and Arya slipped, landing painfully on one knee. The man with the broken pole was not so lucky. She heard him shout as he stumbled over the side. Then the raging brown water closed over him, and he was gone in the time it took Arya to climb back to her feet. One of the other boatmen snatched up a coil of rope, but there was no one to throw it to. Maybe he'll wash up someplace downstream, Arya tried to tell herself, but the thought had a hollow ring. She had lost all desire to go swimming. When Sandra Clegane shouted at her to get back inside before he beat her bloody, she went meekly. The ferry was fighting to turn back on course by then against a river that wanted nothing more than to carry it down to the sea. When they finally came ashore, it was a good two miles down river of their usual landing. The boat slammed into the bank so hard that another pole snapped, and Arya almost lost her feet again. Sandra Clegane lifted her onto Stranger's back as if she weighed no more than a doll. The boatman stared at them with dull, exhausted eyes, all but the bent-backed man who held his hand out. Six dragons, he demanded. Three for the passage and three for the man I lost. Sandra Clegane rummaged in his pouch and shoved a crumpled wad of parchment into the boatman's palm. There, take ten. Ten? The ferryman was confused. What's this now? A dead man's note, good for nine thousand dragons or nearabouts. The hound swung up into the saddle behind Arya and smiled down unpleasantly. Ten of it is yours. I'll be back for the rest one day, so see you don't go spending it. The man squinted down at the parchment. Riding. What good's riding? You promised gold. Knight's honor, you said. 
Knights have no bloody honor. Time you learned that, old man. The hound gave Stranger the spur and galloped off through the rain. The ferryman threw curses at their backs and one or two threw stones. Clegane ignored rocks and words alike, and before long they were lost in the gloom of the trees, the river a dwindling roar behind them. The ferry won't cross back till morning, he said, and that lot won't be taking paper promises from the next fools to come along. If your friends are chasing us, they're going to need to be bloody strong swimmers. Arya huddled down and held her tongue. Valor Morghulis, she thought sullenly. Sir Illyn, Sir Merrin, King Joffrey, Queen Cersei, Dunson, Poliver, Raff the Sweetling, Sir Gregor and the Tickler, and the Hound, the Hound, the Hound. By the time the rain stopped and the clouds broke, she was shivering and sneezing so badly that Clegane called a halt for the night and even tried to make a fire. The wood they gathered proved too wet, though. Nothing he tried was enough to make the spark catch. Finally, he kicked it all apart in disgust. Seven bloody hells, he said. I hate fires. They sat on damp rocks beneath an oak tree, listening to the slow patter of water dripping from the leaves as they ate a cold supper of hard bread, moldy cheese, and smoked sausage. The hound sliced the meat with his dagger and narrowed his eyes when he caught Arya looking at the knife. Don't even think about it. I wasn't, she lied. He snorted to show what he thought of that, but he gave her a thick slice of sausage. Arya worried it with her teeth, watching him all the while. I never beat your sister, the hound said, but I'll beat you if you make me. Stop trying to think up ways to kill me. None of it will do you a bit of good. She had nothing to say to that. She gnawed on the sausage and stared at him coldly. Hard as stone, she thought. At least you look at my face. I'll give you that, you little she-wolf. How do you like it? I don't. It's all burned and ugly. Clegane offered her a chunk of cheese on the point of his dagger. You're a little fool. What good would it do you if you did get away? You'd just get caught by someone worse. I would not, she insisted. There is no one worse. You never knew my brother. Gregor once killed a man for snoring. His own man. When he grinned, the burned side of his face pulled tight, twisting his mouth in a queer, unpleasant way. He had no lips on that side and only the stump of an ear. I did so know your brother. Maybe the mountain was worse now that Arya thought about it. Him and Dunstan and Poliver and Raph the Sweetling and the Tickler? The Hound seemed surprised. And how would Ned Stark's precious little daughter come to know the likes of them? Gregor never brings his pet rats to court. I know them from the village. She ate the cheese and reached for a chunk of hard bread. The village by the lake, where they caught Gendry and me and Hot Pie. They caught Lamy Greenhands, too, but Raph the Sweetling killed him because his leg was hurt. Clegane's mouth twitched. Caught you? My brother caught you? <laughs> that made him laugh, a sour sound, part rumble and part snarl. Gregor never knew what he had, did he? He couldn't have, or he would have dragged you back kicking and screaming to King's Landing and dumped you in Cersei's lap. Oh, that's bloody sweet. I'll be sure and tell him that before I cut his heart out. It wasn't the first time he had talked of killing the mountain. But he's your brother, Arya said dubiously. Didn't you ever have a brother you wanted to kill? He laughed again. Or maybe a sister? He must have seen something in her face then, for he leaned closer. Sansa! <laughs> That's it, isn't it? The wolf bitch wants to kill the pretty bird. No, Arya spat back at him. I'd like to kill you. Because I hacked your little friend in two? I've killed a lot more than him, I promise you. You think that makes me some monster? Well, maybe it does, but I saved your sister's life, too. The day the mob pulled her off her horse, I cut through them and brought her back to the castle, else she would have gotten what Lolly Stokeworth got. And she sang for me. You didn't know that, did you? Your sister sang me a sweet little song. You're lying, she said at once. You don't know half as much as you think you do. The Blackwater? Where in Seven Hells do you think we are? Where do you think we're going? The scorn in his voice made her hesitate. Back to King's Landing, she said. You're bringing me to Joffrey and the Queen. That was wrong, she realized all of a sudden, just from the way he had asked the questions. But she had to say something. Stupid, blind little wolf bitch. His voice was rough and hard as an iron rasp. Bugger Joffrey, bugger the queen, and bugger that twisted little gargoyle she calls a brother. 
I'm done with their city, done with their king's guard, done with Lannisters. What's a dog to do with lions, I ask you? He reached for his water skin, took a long pull. As he wiped his mouth, he offered the skin to Arya and said, The river was the trident, girl, the trident, not the Blackwater. Make the map in your head if you can. On the morrow, we should reach the King's Road. We'll make good time after that, straight up to the twins. It's gonna be me who hands you over to that mother of yours. Not the noble lightning lord or that flaming fraud of a priest, the monster. He grinned at the look in her face. You think your little outlaw friends are the only ones can smell a ransom? Don Darian took my gold, so I took you. You're worth twice what they stole from me, I'd say. Maybe even more if I sold you back to the Lannisters like you fear. But I won't. Even a dog gets tired of being kicked. If this young wolf has the wits the gods gave a toad, he'll make me a lordling and beg me to enter his service. He needs me, though he may not know it yet. Maybe I'll even kill Gregor for him. He'd like that. He'll never take you, she spat back. Not you. Then I'll take as much gold as I can carry, laugh in his face, and ride off. If he doesn't take me, he'd be wise to kill me. But he won't. Too much his father's son, from what I hear. Fine with me. Either way, I win. And so do you, she-wolf. So stop whimpering and snapping at me. I'm sick of it. Keep your mouth shut and do as I tell you. And maybe we'll even be in time for your uncle's bloody wedding. <laughs>